Okay, so welcome to the final lecture of Earth 10 for this quarter. And I've really enjoyed having all of you in class, and I hope that you've at least found some of what you've learned about Antarctica interesting. So today's lecture is going to be a recap of a lot of that material. Last Wednesday's lecture was also a recap. We covered the material that we learned before the midterm, since that is fair game from the exam. It's only going to be about 11 or 12 questions out of 50, but it's still there's still material from before the midterm that you want to know. And I, in the study guide, I made a list of terms near the end, which are keywords from the pre midterm lectures that are likely to show up again. Um, it's also worth looking through the study guide for the midterm at least once just to refresh yourself on what kind of stuff we went over. Um, and today's lecture will be specifically on the material that we've covered in lecture since the midterm. And so that's going to be glaciers, the history of Antarctic exploration and climate change. So a few announcements. Um, all extra credit work needs to be in by Sunday, June 6th. That is also the deadline for the practice quiz that I've put out. For the practice quiz, it's not required you do that. It's just a chance to see what sort of questions are going to be on the final. If you take that quiz, I will give you three extra credit points. And unless you tell me otherwise, I will put those points towards the final. If you have something else that you want me to put the points towards, just let me know. But that the practice quiz is due on Sunday, um, June 6th, if you want to take it. During finals week, there aren't going to be any formal review sessions, but I am going to be having office hours um, on Monday, June 7th, starting at 8 p.m. and then on Wednesday, June 9th, starting at 2 o'clock p.m. And I can meet by appointment if there's, if you need to talk to me about something, but those times don't work. Um, the final itself is going to be open from Monday, June 7th until Friday, June 11th. Um, so it's open during the five days of finals week. Um, hopefully that helps you find a time to do it and schedule around any other classes that do require you to be taking it at a set time. Um, but the deadline to submit grades will be very soon after that Friday. So I won't have a lot of wiggle room in extending it. So make sure you take it during that window. And there's not a whole lot else going on for this class this week or next week. The labs are all done. So likewise, um, teaching assistant office hours are going to be by appointment from this point on. So if you want to meet with your TA, send them an email and um, confirm a time because they aren't necessarily going to be hanging around office hours this week because there aren't labs to work on. There's one more UC Santa Cruz seminar happening Friday. Um, so that, I believe, is actually the last upcoming extra credit opportunity. Um, I wanted to mention that there are, um, if you go to the UCSB Earth Science page, they have a schedule for their colloquia that they've been doing, the weekly graduate student and visiting researcher talks on Thursdays, and they have recordings of those up there. So if you're looking for recordings of geology lectures that have happened this quarter, if, you, if there was one you were interested in but couldn't attend, I am fine with you writing about those. So any questions about scheduling and the like for the remainder of the quarter? And I'll be adding extra credit points um, during and in the immediate aftermath of finals week for those I haven't compiled just yet. So for the final exam, it's going to be very similar in structure to the midterm. It's going to be 50 questions that are mostly multiple choice, a few true or false, and it will be graded automatically. About 11 or 12 questions will be related to the concepts from before the midterm, which I went over more heavily during lecture 18. And then 38 to 39 questions are going to be focused on the post midterm concepts. And they may tangentially relate to material from the climate change articles, the Shackleton reading and the clips that you've watched since the midterm. But I will say that if you've read those once, and if you've seen those once, I don't think you really need to spend time watching or re reviewing them again, because I'm not going to ask you detailed questions on them. It's just to reinforce concepts like what was Shackleton doing there and what's happening to Antarctica climate wise. Um, so the study guide is posted now, um, and that contains a list of key terms that are that, are, that I'm going to be asking questions about. The study guide terms are the terms that I'll be asking questions about. And once you're taking the exam itself, put your study guide away, put your notes away, put 
the lectures away and don't talk to your friends. It is a closed book exam once again. You'll have 75 minutes to complete the exam once you start your attempt. So 75 minutes for 50 questions. Hopefully that'll leave you time to get the ones that you know off the top of your head, good and done with, and then you'll have time to check the ones that you're a little more unsure about. There'll be 10 questions per page, um, but you'll be able to go back to previous pages and check your answers before submitting the whole thing. And again, the exam is going to be open at midnight on Monday, June 7th, and it will close at 11.59 p.m. on Friday, June 11th. Um, so any questions about the scheduling of the exam before I move on to the material? Excuse me. So today, lectures, so today, this is what we're going to go over. Lectures 11 and 12 covered glaciers, and then we had three pretty distinct lectures on history. Lecture 13 covered the pre-discovery phase, and then the discovery of Antarctica itself and the early exploration of its periphery. Lecture 14 covers the heroic age, a much more short, only about 20 years, and much more concentrated window of Antarctic exploration in which the focus was much more heavily Antarctica as opposed to Antarctica and surrounding islands being found or mapped kind of by chance because people were down there to, for whaling or people were sailing close by to find trade routes or the like. The heroic age was much more about Antarctica itself than economic reasons um, or geopolitical reasons, although those aspects never completely disappear because the countries that were sending expeditions were at least in the background, there was a hope for them to establish claims in Antarctica. And then, so lecture 17, the last lecture of new material we had, we jumped into the World Wars history of Antarctica, how we started having more countries started to send troops to Antarctica, and countries started making territorial claims. And in the aftermath of World War II, the Antarctic Treaty was drawn up to establish a framework for governing Antarctica and to stop countries from trying to dominate the country, to make to dominate the continent, to make Antarctica into a bit more of a neutral zone. And then lectures 15 and 16 were about climate change in Antarctica. Lecture 15 was more heavily about the science of climate change. Lecture 16 focused on climate records from Antarctica, as well as on the effects of climate change specifically in Antarctica. And about 75% of the questions will draw from and only from this material. Um, Whereas the other questions might draw connections with this material, but they'll also, they might reference a topic that you learned about before the midterm. So some of the questions related to the pre-midterm material might have connections to this material. You might see connections between when we learned about the climate, the, like the basic climate of Antarctica, and then later talked about how it's being changed by climate change, or when we talked about, um, when we talked about Antarctic wildlife and then during the history um, section later we touched on how Antarctic wildlife was affected by human hunting. So those are a couple of examples of connections that could show up. Um, so the first topic we got to after the midterm was glaciers and we talked about how glaciers fit into the water cycle and we then went into some of the, some of the physical varieties of glaciers. We have continental glaciers that are not constrained by surrounding topography, and those include the Antarctic ice sheets, as well as the smaller Greenland ice sheet, and then the little ice caps that you sometimes get covering parts of Arctic islands. Then you have a number of glaciers whose shape is defined by where they're accumulating or where they're, or where they're flowing through, like cirque glaciers that are forming in the U-shaped valleys near the top of mountains, or valley glaciers, or glaciers that are reaching the ocean, like outflow glaciers, or the specific type that is heavily affected by the tides, tidewater glaciers. One thing to remember about glaciers is that they change form as they travel throughout their course. For example, lobes of the Antarctic ice sheets might start to behave more like valley glaciers as they get squeezed in between mountains in the Trans-Antarctic mountain range, and then they'll behave more like this Piedmont glacier if say that that flow goes into a wider valley and the ice flow is able to spread out again. Again, kind of like a river slowing down as it exits a canyon. Um, so we talked about how, um, so basically we, 
we started off with learning what a glacier is and the different shapes of glaciers you can get. And part of, the, part of that is thinking about where Earth's water is and where Antarctica's water is. So for the potential question, I ask you about the water cycle and it's in what reservoir does most of Earth's fresh water reside? And you wanna remember that reservoir is just any place where water stays for an extended period of time. So the possibilities are Piedmont glaciers, ice sheets, groundwater, freshwater lakes, and tidewater glaciers. And you wanna think about just which of these is the biggest by far? Which of these have I emphasized takes up a lot of water? And the answer is going to be B, because ice sheets are the largest glaciers. Most of Earth's freshwater is in fact in glaciers. And if most of Earth's freshwater is in glaciers, then most of it's going to be in the largest glaciers, in the glaciers that take up a huge percentage of the volume of ice on Earth. So it's going to be in the east, west, and Greenland ice sheets. Piedmont glaciers tend to be pretty puny. This is just a little, the Piedmont glacier here is just kind of this little lobe here. And that's puny compared to the ice sheets themselves. So that's kind of what I'm getting at with that question. Um, so continuing on with glaciers, we learned about how the fastest parts of glaciers will be known as ice streams. And those often form in the center of glaciers as well as um, on the surface of glaciers as opposed to the base of glaciers. Since at the surface, there's less friction and in the center, as opposed to the sides, there is less friction. There is more, there is more friction at the sides and on the bottom where the glacier is grinding against rock. We talked about how glaciers um, can create subglacial lakes because especially in the really thick ice sheets, the pressure from the overlying glacier can be so great that the high pressure actually allows some liquid water to exist. Raising the pressure lowers the melting point of water and allows some liquid water to exist at lower temperatures. So you have subglacial lakes and you have some rivers flowing between them. Then on the surface, you have ice streams and those will sometimes form ice falls when they go down a steep slope. Glaciers will also reach the ocean and in Antarctica because, well, in Antarctica for reasons that I'll hint at, um, but glaciers actually continue over the ocean um, instead of calving or breaking up right along the coast. So you have the glaciers flowing out over the ocean as ice shelves. The ice shelves like the Ross ice shelf are indeed extensions of the glaciers. And those are distinct from sea ice, which forms from ocean water freezing. Ice shelves are actually the frozen water from inland flowing out over the ocean. They will eventually break up. They'll, um, they'll flow over, to, over the ocean and the heat from the ocean will eventually cause them to weaken and break up into icebergs, the process known as calving. And so the potential question here is meant to remind you of um, the term used for when glaciers build up. So Antarctic glaciers continue to flow out over the ocean as ice sheets when they reach the ocean, because what process is still occurring on the coast? And the possibilities are equilibrium, ablation, accumulation, calving, and plucking. And yes, that is correct. The answer is indeed accumulation because that refers to glaciers building up. Glaciers are still accumulating on the coastline in Antarctica because, because, it's, because frankly, it's so cold. That's a lot of it. But they continue to flow out over the ocean. And that's, that's distinct because in most parts of the world, you don't have glaciers flowing out over the ocean, at least not very far. Um, you'll have You'll have tidewater glaciers, but that's kind of the, the end of the glacier is just kind of like right along the shore. And Greenland, the glaciers don't really go over the, over the ocean much um, because the glaciers there aren't accumulating as much either. So it's presently a feature that's pretty unique to Antarctica. Any questions about glaciers so far? Uh, is there like an easy way to remember all of the different processes, like an anagram or something? Hmm. Well, it's helpful to remember that the terms for glaciers getting bigger and smaller both start with A. And then calving reminds me, and then calving specifically refers to like when glaciers are breaking up over the ocean. And it's called that because it's like the glacier is breaking up into lots of tiny glaciers, kind of like the idea of like calves being like tiny cows sort of. And plucking is a term related to erosion. So that's one I just threw in here to test you as to whether you recognize that that's an erosion term or not. Um, but to, but 
remember that to accumulate means to build up and ablation is a word that you don't necessarily come, come across that much out of science context, but um, it means to destroy or to remove in general. Um, like if you remember me talking about when I did my research and was obtaining radio, 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 like re obtaining radioactivity data, the way we did it was through laser ablation. We'd use a laser to destroy the surface of a mineral and um, obtain data from the vaporized surface of the mineral, basically. So you can think of ablation as being, so if that helps you remember what ablation is. Um, I will, going forward, see if I can think of a mnemonic for that, though. Um, I'm sure I'll think of one like two hours after this, after this session. If I do think of one, I will send it to you. Okay, thank you. Yep. Other questions? So one reminder that in addition to categorizing glaciers by what they're flowing over or what they're flowing through, there's also a way to ca categorize them by whether they're warm or cold, basically. Cold-based glaciers are those found in Antarctica. And for those, the ice temperature, whether you're at the surface or at the bottom of the glacier, never quite reaches the pressure melting temperature line of water. The pressure melt temperature, remember, is, it's the temperature, it's the melting temperature at different pressures. Because as you go to the bottom of a glacier, the pressure goes up. And in glaciers found outside of Antarctica, those found in Patagonia or Tibet, for example, those glaciers, those glaciers are a little bit warmer throughout because of heating from the sun. And the ice temperature actually pretty closely follows the pressure melting temperature of water. And you can get a fair bit of meltwater in these glaciers, including a good amount of meltwater at the bottom, which will overall make these glaciers flow a bit faster, as well as experience more movement via slip and sliding, via basal sliding, as opposed to them creeping forward as they change shape, which I'll talk about a bit on the next slide when I review glacial movement. But this categorization system is completely separate from that that's based on the shapes of the glaciers. So an ice sheet can hypothetically either be cold base or warm base, although in practice most ice sheets are going to be cold base because they're in the poles. But a valley glacier could be either cold base or warm base. A Piedmont glacier could be either cold base or warm base. A Cirque glacier could be either cold, cold base or warm base. So remember that it's a separate categorization system. As far as how glaciers move and how it's connected to that, glaciers can either move as a single cohesive mass, and that's more common with warm-based glaciers. Glaciers can also flow like a very thick, viscous fluid downhill in which the ice will, the ice crystals will slowly change shape and shift as opposed to, as opposed to cracking. Now, if glaciers come under sudden stress, cracks do form. The ice will break and form what are known as crevasses. And that'll happen when glaciers flow around sharp turns or if they flow over rough terrain. Um, and crevasses come and go over time because the landscape that the glaciers are flowing over changes over time. The glaciers erode what is underneath them. So for example, if crevasses are being caused by a mound underneath the glacier and eventually the glacier erodes that mound away, then after the mound is eroded away, you probably won't see as many crevasses because the mound won't be there to cause stress to the ice that's flowing over it. Um, and crevasses can come and go seasonally, so that's why it's important that when people are actually doing research and exploring Antarctica, um, they pay attention to satellite images to see whether crevasses have opened up in new areas and they that they be aware just that an area of ice that seems smooth and relatively safe now could, or that seemed smooth and relatively safe a couple months ago or a couple years ago, could have developed crevasses in the meantime. The last bit of glacier, the last bit of information we talked about related to glaciers was erosion, because Antarctica is unique in that most erosion or breakdown of rock and removal of sediment or of broken down rock that occurs mostly via glaciers in Antarctica, outside of a little bit that's 
done by wind. Wind does create features known as vent effects in Antarctica, but for the most part, rock is broken down by ice, by glaciers in Antarctica, as opposed to liquid water, which is the dominant method of erosion elsewhere. Um, and glaciers, glacial erosion is complex because they can do two things to the rock underneath them. Um, I recognize that the word abrasion is kind of similar to ablation, but they actually mean similar things. Ablating means Ablating, ablation refers to the glacier going away, and abrasion refers to the glacier taking the rock underneath away. Abrading rock means grinding it down into tiny pieces and slowly removing it over time. Abrasion will produce polished surfaces and grooves um, or striations. Um, glaciers will also pluck large pieces of rock via a process that occurs when Glaciers start to flow over rough terrain, like how I mentioned previously, that can lead to crevasses. On the bottom of the glacier, it also leads to a pressure buildup. Um, and that increase in pressure actually allows some liquid water to form because under high pressure, water can exist as a liquid at lower temperatures. But when the glacier, as it's flowing, passes that mound, when the stress is gone, the pressure drops, like the pressure decreases. And when the pressure decreases, that means that what liquid water is there can't be liquid anymore because the pressure melting temperature changes with the pressure. So the water becomes frozen again and that sticks to the bit of rock underneath it and the forward motion of the glacier will pluck or remove bits of rock. And that'll leave behind features known as chatter marks. And glaciers, just as the actual process of them removing the rocks is complex, they produce, glaciers produce a number of different products of erosion, which we can see both in the sediments deposited by glaciers in the present, as well as in the rock record. Glaciers carry some stuff just on their surface because rocks fall onto glaciers, meteorites fall onto glaciers sometimes, and that will just be carried along on the surface like, like boats floating down a river almost. Um, so it's kind of interesting that that occurs with glaciers because if stuff just falls into the water, if you have liquid water, it sinks to the bottom. But rocks falling on top of a glacier don't sink to the bottom, they get carried on top. Um, the sediment that's pushed out by glaciers where they end is known as till. And till becomes diamictite when it becomes lithified or turned into a rock. And diamictite is good evidence of glaciers when we're looking at the rock record. The terminal moraine, which is are those mounds that you see at the feet of glaciers, that is made up of till. Um, Meltwater from glaciers produces outwash. Um, outwash sometimes produces a pattern called varves that we'll talk about when we review the climate change material, because that's very useful for studying climate change. It'll also produce glacial flower. And then Plucked bits of rocks especially often become erratics or drop stones. And erratics are boulders left behind where glaciers previously carried them far away from mountains, but where the glaciers have since melted. Drop stones occur often in places like Antarctica where you have ice shelves continuing out over the ocean and the plucked bits of rock will stay stuck on the bottom of the ice shelves until the ice shelves start to break up or have, and then the drop stones, the, the plucked bits of rock will fall to the ocean floor and they'll become drop stones. You'll, they'll be these, these boulders that are buried in these layers of ocean sediment, which tends to be more muddy. So drop stones stick out in the rock record. And they are a good bit of evidence that you've had glaciers at sea level when those rocks were formed. So the potential question is about what actually what actually till is made of, like what, what, what it's going to be like. And the question is till in regards to the size of the grains of sediment in it is said to be what? And the possibilities are lithified, abraded, well sorted, poorly sorted, or erratic. And the answer is D, poorly sorted, because I've emphasized the fact that glaciers kind of bulldoze everything out of their way. For the most part, they grind things up, but because they also pluck, bits of boulders get mixed in. So till, the stuff that actually gets pushed out at the end, tends to be kind of a hodgepodge of sizes. So yes, it is, that is correct. It is poorly sorted.
So questions about glaciers before I move on to Antarctic history. So when we moved on to glaciers, we shifted the focus over from science to history. And on this slide, I've put some of these questions you, you might have seen before, but I've put some I've put some questions related to broader thematic questions in the history portion that are kind of meant to be food for thought. Why was Antarctica not known to humanity at all until 1820? Why were lots of tiny islands discovered first? What has driven Antarctic exploration throughout different periods? Who first sighted Antarctica? Why did people continue to go there? What was the heroic age and why, why is that sort of distinct from earlier periods of Antarctic exploration? How is Antarctica used by people today? Um, and what does the future hold from Antarctic, for Antarctica with climate change as well as with questions about how humans should be using Antarctica in the present day. And I do really recommend that for the history lectures that you watch the videos if you have not seen them, because I think the video explanations help contextualize some of it a lot better than just the slides do. And that it's easier to, un and that it's easier to understand that way. Um, so the potential question here is one that I put in place to get you to think about some of the innovations in technology along the way that made Antarctic exploration possible. And the question is, in the 19th century, James Clark Ross entered the sea that would later bear his name, and he was able to penetrate a lot farther than previous explorers into the sea ice and the ice shelves because of what innovation? So what let him get farther into the ice? A marine chronometer, an astrolabe, aerial photography, reinforced wooden ship hulls or ships with no masts? And the answer is indeed D, that is correct, because I talked about how many of the issues getting to Antarctica early on were related to the difficulty of getting through sea ice and the risk of being trapped. And um, the reason James Clark Ross was able to get as far south as he did and as far and as close to the shoreline is that he had ships that had reinforced hulls, ships that were strengthened against the ice. The marine chronometer is an innovation I talked about, though. That's basically an ocean, a, a, a clock that keeps time at sea and lets you determine longitude accurately. Astrolabes help you determine latitude by using the sun and the stars. Um, so those are those are things I talked about, but they don't necessarily relate to the sea ice specifically. And you'll want to think about when answering a question like this, which of these would logically help you get through sea ice specifically. And in terms of the different periods of Antarctic history, we, we started off learning about early explorers of the Southern Ocean and the age of discovery and how European exploration of the globe brought people closer and closer to Antarctica um, and how that eventually led to early sightings of the continent and a number of early expeditions into the surrounding waters, very few of which until, until the mid 19th century, nobody actually landed on Antarctica itself. Um, and there was maybe an expedition like every 10 years or something like that until we get to the heroic age when there was a renewed push to open up more of the continent, um, both for science and for just the simple glory of exploration, but also for the potential to claim parts of Antarctica. Um, so the first two periods were lecture 13. The heroic age was lecture 14. We then jumped to climate change so that we could do that all in one week. And then the last lecture that I had was on the post-heroic age history. So World Wars era, and then after the World Wars and the signing of the treaty and the, the International Geophysical Year. And then I talked a little bit about modern Antarctica and what, what economic activity goes on now, what sort of tourism goes on in Antarctica, etc. So in terms of the pre-discovery history, these are some people that you might expect to see questions about. So Magellan, he didn't go to Antarctica itself, but his cruise voyages put um, a passageway between the Pacific and the Atlantic together on people's radar. Um, and then how Captain James Cook's second voyage was in particular an attempt to find the hypothetical southern continent, often nicknamed Terra Incognita Australis, when people didn't really know for sure what was there, um, where it was, how close to the pole it was, and what kind of climate it would have. 
We talked about how there's never been an indigenous population in Antarctica and why that might have been just because Antarctica is so far from inhabited lands and because the Southern Ocean is quite windy and dangerous, which we've talked about when we learned about the Antarctic climate. Um, we went into the motivations that led Europeans to start exploring the rest of the globe um, and how in addition to economics and trade routes and imperialism, there was in particular an interest in this mythical hypothetical southern continent, um, which is specifically, again, what Captain Cook was down there looking for. Um, and so the you also want to think about what made Antarctic, what made what made these voyages difficult. Um, for example, I talked about the marine chronometer on the last slide and how that was a device that allowed for longitude to be determined accurately at sea. And that was one reason why Captain Cook's voyage was overall more successful because during his voyages, he had a marine chronometer and that let him determine where he was in terms of his position east or west a lot more accurately and also enabled him and his map makers to make much more accurate depictions of the world afterwards. He got south of the Antarctic Circle and got very close to Antarctica itself. Um, but not quite close enough. And he came away convinced that there was no, no Antarctica after all, which of course we know is not the case. So the example question here is about what Ferdinand Magellan was doing near South America. And for one thing, when you answer a question like this, you wanna think about from what part of history he's from. Is he a heroic age figure? Is he a, is he a figure from the world wars? Or is he like an early exploration figure? So the possibilities are he was looking for penguins. He was looking for a trade route between the Atlantic and the Pacific. He was looking for the geographic South Pole. He was searching for terra incognita australis, or he was searching for the magnetic South Pole. And the answer is B. Um, for one thing, there is, is a geographic feature named after Magellan. It's the Straits of Magellan, and that's in South America. He didn't actually sail through the Southern Ocean itself. He found the path, he, he mapped a passageway between the mainland of South America and Terra del Fuego, which is the island that's the southernmost tip, to establish a trade route between the Atlantic and Pacific. But he wasn't really looking for Antarctica itself um, or anything similar to it. Um, so again, when answering questions like this, think about the motivations for exploration during different periods and try to associate people's names with different periods. Magellan and, Francis, and Sir Francis Drake and Captain Cook and John Davis and the like are from the pre-discovery of Antarctica. Um, when we do get to the discovery of Antarctica itself, we have Mr. Bellingshausen, whom the um, Bellingshausen Sea is named after, becomes the first person to spot Antarctica. Um, shortly afterwards, Nathaniel Palmer and some British folks also spot Antarctica, so it becomes common knowledge that there is indeed a southern continent very quickly, but it's not immediately clear how big it is, how much of it is land, and whether there's land at the South Pole or water there, um, what's in it, whether, there, whether it's habitable, whether it's possible to establish radio contact between Antarctica and the rest of the world. So Antarctica is known to exist by the early 19th century, by the early 1800s, but not much is known about it just yet. And we get a period from its discovery in 1820-ish until 1890 when the heroic age begins in which we have scattered voyages to the surrounding areas, but not a lot of progress made in actually mapping more of Antarctica itself. Um, and part of this is that um, a lot of the people who go to Antarctica during the pre-heroic age aren't necessarily there to do things related to Antarctica itself. Specifically, they're there for economic purposes, namely whaling and sealing, or possibly also finding finding oil, although that becomes more of a factor later on. Um, so remember that the sub-Antarctic islands like South Georgia and the Falkland Islands and Kerguelen, those are all easier to reach than Antarctica itself. And you get people landing and settling on those a lot faster than you get people reaching Antarctica itself because they're farther north and they also have bigger populations of seals and they form, they, they make a good place to establish harbors for whaling, um, which is again, what a lot of the people are doing down here during the 19th century. Um, 
And when we talked about whaling and sealing, I mentioned that both industries later collapsed because both fur seals and whales and baleen whales were hunted almost to extinction. Um, not to mention that the demand for whale oil, which um, was used to light lamps before electricity went into common usage, but once electricity took hold, the need for whale oil dropped. So that industry collapsed because of that. So Mr. Palmer, who I mentioned before, was someone who was in Antarctica, mostly for his sealing purposes. He did discover a number of islands, but only published the locations of those islands later, or they were discovered in his effects later on after he died, because he wasn't interested in spreading this knowledge to people who might compete with him for the natural resources on these islands. Um, and it's a very different framework for how Antarctica is thought of today. Antarctica today is not really a place that humans should are allowed to be competing with each other for. Science has to be collaborative. People can't be hiding what they're doing in Antarctica from other people. So early on in Antarctica's history, it was quite different. You had people trying to hide their sealing places from people, people trying to be the first one to reach the South Pole, as opposed to another country's party. Um, one interesting thing is that you do have an intersection between science and economic need here, like James Waddell, who the Waddell Sea is named after, um, did go to Antarctica out of a scientific interest. He reached a new, a new farthest south, a new um, record for having gone as far south as possible, um, and did come back with a lot of scientific samples. But the bottom line is that he was employed as a sealer. He was just he was there out of an interest in science, but he was making money by sealing. Um, you also have the Wilkes expedition, which was the first um, United States expedition, which was mainly to obtain samples for science that would become part of the Smithsonian collection later on. But there was also the purpose of mapping new whaling and sealing grounds. Um, and the US government very much knew that when they, when they funded this expedition. They had received a lot of lobbying from whaling and sealing companies in New England that wanted the expedition to happen for that exact reason. Um, you have. So we talked about James Clark Ross um, in one of the previous questions, um, and he's um, he's kind of the last person we talk about before the heroic age. He goes to Antarctica in the 1840s, and very few people go to Antarctica, at least very much after that, until the 1890s. Ross is British. The British don't send another expedition until the 1890s. Um, and so the example question here highlights some early discoveries in Antarctica before the heroic age. And the question is, who was the first person to spot Mount Erebus and the Transantarctic Mountains? The island that McMurdo Base is on is named after him. So we have James Clark Ross, Captain James Cook, Nathaniel Palmer, Sir Edmund Hillary, and Richard Byrd. And a couple of these people hopefully you can rule out because they are figures from the 20th century. And yes, the answer is A, because um, James Clark Ross is um, he's kind of, he does a lot of these surveying work before some of the really famous heroic age expeditions. Like he establishes where Ross Island is. He sees Mount Erebus, he sees the Transantarctic Mountains and his writings later inspire people like Shackleton and Amundsen and Scott to go further into the Antarctic interior. But he only sees a lot of these things from his ship. He doesn't go onto the Antarctic mainland itself. So any history related questions so far? The heroic age is notable for a more, for a speeding up of the exploration and for 17 different expeditions happening in the space of about just 25 years or so. So a lot more people going to Antarctica than have ever been there before. And a lot more people going to Antarctica specifically for and our exploration as opposed to being there sort of tangentially on the side because there happens to be money in the sealing and whaling there. Um, part of it is that the um, part of it is that the California gold rush and the the increased development of the Western United States um, that incites a lot of people to start, a lot of people start passing through the Straits of Magellan and near the subantarctic islands on the way from the Atlantic to the Pacific now, because the Panama Canal doesn't exist yet. So there's a lot more people in the Southern Ocean than before. Interest in Antarctica starts to increase. Um, 
and there also becomes there also ends up being more of this focus on using science to compete with other countries than there was before using science and achievements in say being the first person to reach the south pole or being the first country to sponsor an expedition that crosses the continent there's glory in that and that becomes more of a focus during the heroic age during the around the turn of the century um so again i highly recommend making sure that you watch the whole lectures for the heroic age especially if you haven't done so already um and the heroic age is known as such aside from the focus on exploration itself because in retrospect it's recognized for the people who went on these expeditions achieving a lot and also dealing with some pretty intense hardships um such as um robert falcon scott being being the second person to reach the south pole but not making it back or shackleton's crew all surviving their expedition but almost not making it and having to abandon their original goal of trying to cross the, cross the continent. Um, so I don't want you to memorize every single expedition, but hopefully you should at least have in your head what countries sent expeditions and which didn't. So here, here's a question of which countries work actually kind of absent from the heroic age push. Which of the following countries did not send an expedition to Antarctica during the heroic age? And the possibilities are the United Kingdom, France, Japan, the United States, and Sweden. The answer is actually D. The United States did not send any expeditions to Antarctica during the heroic age. Um, the only time I actually talked about the US during lecture 14 at all was when I talked about Matthew Henson going to the North Pole. But Japan did send an expedition. I briefly mentioned them because it's one of the few non-European countries that did, and Sweden did as well. Um, now, in terms of some of the now, in terms of some of these specific figures, I there are some of the expeditions where I'm not that likely to ask you about these specific people. In terms of people who show up multiple times, who I am very likely to ask you about, um, Robert Falcon Scott, for example, comes up multiple times because he went two separate. He went twice to Antarctica separately. He went um, and tried to reach the South Pole and ended up just exploring around the Ross Sea. So reaching the polar plateau and seeing the dry valleys and mapping the coastline of the Ross Sea. And later on during his second visit, he would reach the South Pole but perish on the way back. Um, Amundsen, who beat him to the South Pole, had also actually been to Antarctica previously. He'd gone on the Belgian Antarctic expedition, which was the first of the Heroic Age expeditions with Mr. de Gerlache. Um, Douglas Mawson, who is not maybe quite as known by name, uh, but he shows up a couple times because he um, first goes to Antarctica with Shackleton on Shackleton's Nimrod expedition, and um, he's one of the crew to summit Mount Erebus with Shackleton. He later goes back to Antarctica um, during the Australian Antarctic expedition, which is primarily concerned with reaching the geographic, excuse me, with the magnetic South Pole and establishing radio contact between Antarctica and the mainland and also establishing Antarctic bases. And that is something you see during the heroic age. You see the first attempts to make permanent bases. Um, and for the most part, that doesn't go well. Um, people realize they have a lot to learn about what's needed to survive the Antarctic winter. Um, and there, people realize that there's a lot of dangers lurking that you really need to be aware of. Like Mawson almost loses his life by falling into a crevasse. He survives, but several of his men don't. And he ends up being, so heavily delayed in his return back to camp that they have to spend another winter there because the ship taken that was supposed to take him and his men back has to leave before he ends up coming back. Speaking of Shackleton again, Shackleton went to Antarctica several times. He went with Scott when Scott just explored the Ross Sea. Um, he later led his own expedition, the Nimrod expedition to Ross Island, and he tried to reach the South Pole then. Didn't quite succeed, um, which which left him with this intense desire to return to Antarctica and one up that because by the time that he got to Antarctica again the South Pole had been reached by Amundsen and Scott. So his most famous expedition is um, 
what was meant to be the Imperial Transantarctic Expedition. Um, Imperial because of the British Empire, Transantarctic because he intended to cross Antarctica from sea to frigid sea. Um, and something that doesn't get talked about a lot that I mentioned briefly is that there was a separate party um, that went on a different ship um, to the other side of the continent to lay supplies for Shackleton and his men and to await their arrival. That never happened because Shackleton and his crew and the Endurance got stuck in the ice, had to abandon their ship and make a wild escape to South Georgia Island, which they managed to pull off against the odds. Um, and sort of appropriately Shackleton's very last attempt to reach Antarctica, which ended with him passing away from a heart attack while he was on South Georgia and being buried there. That's treated as the end of the heroic age. That's also when the first world war was erupting more or less. And the heroic age sort of begins with the gold rush and the, and with industrialization during the second half of the 19th century. It, it officially begins around 1890 or so, and then it ends with World War I. So it's overall a pretty short period of history, but a lot happens during it. And that's why we spend a whole lecture on it. Um, so the example question here is about one of these figures, which heroic age explorer accompanied Shackleton on his Nimrod expedition, climbing Mount Erebus with him, and later commandeered the Australian Antarctic expedition to the South Magnetic Pole, during which time he almost died falling under crevasse. And the possibilities are James Clark Ross, Captain James Cook, Roald Amundsen, Douglas Mawson, and Robert Falcon Scott. And hopefully you can rule out a couple of these people because they're not really from the heroic age. So yes, that is the Mawson expedition. Um, he is most famous for getting, he is most famous for trying to build radio stations and trying to build bases in Antarctica while reaching the um, South Magnetic Pole and for none of that really working out, for the bases not really working and for him almost perishing by falling under a crevasse during the operation. Um, Ross is not a hero. Ross is from pre-heroic age, from before really anyone landed in Antarctica, so you can rule him out. Captain James Cook also never got to Antarctica. And Amundsen and Scott, you can sort of rule out because I don't really ever talk about them trying to get to the magnetic pole. They try to get to the geographic pole, what we think of as the South Pole, but, but they didn't do any of this stuff. Jumping ahead just a little bit past the climate change lectures, when we returned to the modern history of Antarctica, the first half of lecture 17 sums up some key events in the post-heroic age history, how countries that had sent expeditions during the heroic age started making territorial claims. And there was a simmering tensions over who actually owns Antarctica. And then I talked about some of the attempts to build bases like Richard Byrd's Little America, um, or the UK's Operation Tabarin, which they built some of the first permanent bases in Antarctica. And the UK was building up their military presence in Antarctica to, in an anticipated, basically to, to offset potential, potential incursions by the Axis powers during World War II, and also to, um, and also kind of to discourage Argentina, which was neutral, but sort of had ties with, but had ties with Germany um, during the Second World War. Um, we talked about Operation High Jump, which is when the United States sent people to Antarctica supposedly to get aerial pictures, but it was a cover up for finding a location for a base where they could potentially train people to fight the Soviet Union. Um, so a lot of stuff that doesn't go on in Antarctica today, people just kind of going and building bases willy nilly without really getting permission to do it necessarily, people sending troops there, people looking for military bases, none of that is allowed now, and none of that is allowed now because of the Antarctic Treaty. Um, the Antarctic Treaty came about as a result of the International Geophysical Year, which is when in 1958, the scientists from around, around the world um, pushed for there to be increased research in Antarctica. There was a desire to follow up on some of the discoveries made during the heroic age that hadn't really been touched on in the period since then, because we had World War I, then a really tense period between the two world wars, and then 
the Second World War and the Holocaust and everything that happened in the 30s and 40s. So really not much research went on in Antarctica during the World Wars. The International Geophysical Year was called to see if what could be done to find out more about what was going on in Antarctica to possibly make a concerted effort to establish some scientific research bases and also to see if it was possible for countries to collaborate um, on research there, which was a new concept in many ways because most of the previous expeditions were this country sends it or this this king sends it. They weren't necessarily designed, they weren't necessarily explicitly chartered for science found for the greater good of humanity necessarily. Um, and that's at least the ideal of what Antarctic research should be today. And that's that's an ideal that began during the International Geophysical Year when scientists were sent there and bases like Ammons and Scott South Pole Base were built to primarily allow science and to allow collaborative science. And part of the reason they were interested in collaboration was because this was during a thawing during the Cold War. There was a little bit of an easing of relations between the US and the Soviet Union in the late 1950s. And there was some hope that research collaboration might help continue to ease that tension. Um, so the International Geophysical Year, in addition to leading to some of the first permanent bases, um, also led to the realization that there needed to be a legal framework for how humans dealt with Antarctica. So that's the Antarctic Treaty and the Antarctic Treaty System. And the treaty system um, nullifies territorial claims and re regulates sealing, fishing, and whaling, and um, it prohibits a number of things. So. The, t the example question here is about the treaty system. And it says, as a result of the Antarctic treaty system, what activity is completely banned in Antarctica? So the possibilities are tourism, fishing, flying helicopters, international base examinations, or mining. And the answer is indeed E, mining. And we do talk about fishing. Fishing does happen in Antarctica still. Um, Something I talked about in lecture 17b is how there is, the treaty doesn't really, doesn't officially ban fishing in Antarctic waters. Um, it puts quotas in place. And there's a lot of issues today with Antarctic waters being overfished because fish populations in the waters north of Antarctica are starting to decline. But mining just does not happen in Antarctica at all um, because it's viewed as too, too environmentally destructive. And that's accurate. Also, it's questionable as to how many minerals there are in Antarctica, but um, there is also a complete ban on removing fossil fuels. And there are known to be fossil fuels in Antarctica, but they can't be extracted because of it's been agreed that that would pose too much of a risk to Antarctic ecosystems. And then there's the question of who gets to profit from Antarctica. The question, like, there's this thought of, should should one country be allowed to claim the minerals in Antarctica as their own? And the treaty is kind of there to say, no, not really. We, this this isn't this isn't really here for people. This isn't really these minerals aren't here for people to do anything with. But some fishing still goes on, and it's questionable as to how much should go on. And that's kind of what we went into with lecture 17b, um, where. I focused on conservation in Antarctica and how, in addition to the overall, the continent as a whole being very heavily protected, you have specially protected areas known as ASPAs or Antarctic Special Protected Areas where it's even more strictly regulated what you can do. These are areas with, mic with extremophile microorganisms or penguins or with cultural resources like huts or other remnants from the exploration that could be damaged or um, or ventifacts that could be damaged by humanity. Basically, Antarctica does have its own version of national parks, um, where it's especially strictly regulated as to who can go in, how often, and what can be done there. Um, and then we went into what economic activity still goes on in Antarctica and what doesn't. Um, tourism goes on. Some people that you have lots of cruise ships going to Antarctica, and then you have a small number of tourists landing, and there's questions over how much how many tourists should be allowed to go to Antarctica, as well as people not realizing that the rules of the Antarctic Treaty do actually apply to anyone who goes south of the area that it covers. And that includes tourists who are just there to have fun. 
Um, so fishing and some whaling go on still, um, which are both controversial. And there are some minerals and fossil fuels on the Antarctic continent that could hypothetically be extracted, but that is completely banned under the treaty. And we talked about how near Antarctica, even though on Antarctica itself, military bases can't be built and there's the only military activities are those that are explicitly just just there to support scientists. So the Air Force can fly scientists to Antarctica, but they can't they can't drop bombs on Antarctica. Um, however, you've had people test bombs on the subantarctic islands, like you've had South Africa test a nuclear weapon on Prince Edward Island. And then you had the Falklands War when the UK and Argentina went to war over, um, well, actually over the natural resource um, in this question. And so the, so the Falklands War, the tensions leading into the Falklands War had been there for a while. Argentina and the UK have been butting heads for various reasons for years. but. Um, in the 1980s, what natural resource were both countries really hungering for? Was it whales, fur seals, copper, Antarctic toothfish, or oil that the UK and Argentina went to war over? And indeed, it was oil. Um, because again, after the Antarctic Treaty signed, there's a lot less sealing and whaling than before. They're both heavily much more regulated. And also, it's no longer economical, plus Nobody needs nobody needs to kill whales to light lamps anymore. Basically, that's just not a need anymore. Um, and copper is a possibility, but it's something I only talk about um, as being a hypothetical that could be in Antarctica. And I did linger on it a little bit on the fact that there is a lot of oil in the Southern Ocean and near Antarctica itself. There's that can't really be extracted, but north of the zone covered by the treaty, we've seen that some countries have gone into conflict over who owns the subantarctic islands because Argentina claims the Falkland Islands and therefore they think that the oil and the surrounding waters also belongs to them. So the treaty is there to preempt stuff like this, but we see that in the areas not affected by the treaty, we see stuff like this happen and that it's a portent of what could happen if the treaty expires. So any questions related to the history of Antarctica before I jump into climate change? So when we went into climate change, we first started talking about some key concepts related to the science. So I talked about how you have different controls on climate, like Milankovitch cycles, plate tectonics, and greenhouse gases. And then I talked about how greenhouse gases play a role in regulating Earth's climate. Um, and carbon dioxide, which is not the only greenhouse gas, but one of the more prominent ones, its abundance in the atmosphere is either increased or reduced by different processes. Um, so we talked about different sinks um, of carbon from the atmosphere and sources of carbon to the atmosphere, which is part of the carbon cycle, how carbon is converted from, say, the hydrocarbons and fossil fuels into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere when people burn fossil fuels, or how um, CO2 in the ocean ends up being converted to carbonate, to solid carbonate under normal conditions and that ends up being subducted and removed from the atmosphere long term. We talked about the current climate crisis and how that's being made worse by positive feedbacks, like the fact that melting sea ice is exposing darker colored ocean water, which absorbs a lot more solar radiation, and that's pushing climate change even further along. Then lecture 16 focused on paleoclimatology and Antarctica's climate record during the first half and the effects of modern climate change during the second half. So we have different greenhouse gases. We have water, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. And overall, they make about 1% of the atmosphere in total. Um, not very abundant overall, but the, the Earth's climate is very sensitive to small changes in greenhouse gases. So a change on the scale of a few parts per million of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere has the potential to raise global temperatures, and it has already done so. Um, so Water vapor, um, so we talked about different, how these different greenhouse gases are being affected by human activity, how CO2 is being released in record numbers because of humans burning fossil fuels, and also how human agricultural practices and human landfill is releasing methane, which is a stronger greenhouse gas than CO2, and how um, 
how some effects of global warming are leading to a positive feedback cycle, how, for example, permafrost, which is the frozen soil in the Arctic, is melting as a result of rising air temperatures. That permafrost has methane in it, and the methane is now being released by the melting permafrost, and that is making global warming even worse. And remember that greenhouse gases are not an inherently bad thing. Their presence in the atmosphere is normally regulated and in equilibrium because of natural processes and in the carbon cycle and other cycles. But humanity is very rapidly releasing so much CO2 into the atmosphere that the Earth's the Earth is not able to balance that out very quickly, and it's causing runaway warming. Earth is getting a lot warmer in a much more rapid period of time than is normal. So potential question here is about different types of greenhouse gases and which ones are being directly affected by people. So which of the following is a greenhouse gas that is not being released by humans in large amounts? And those are carbon dioxide, methane, CFCs, water vapor, and carbonate. And the, an oops, I apologize. The answer is D because water vapor is a greenhouse gas, but humans aren't releasing a lot more water than they were before. Um, we are releasing a lot of CO2, mostly by burning fossil fuels, and methane we are releasing by our agricultural processes. Um, you get methane from ranching, from, from the population of cows and other um, grazing animals, increasing big time over the past couple of decades as the demand for beef, beef has gone up, and from landfill, and from the melting of permafrost, because human, humans cause global warming, the permafrost melts because of that, and that releases even more methane. Carbonate is not a greenhouse gas, that is a solid. That's the mineral that forms actually in the ocean when carbon dioxide is trapped. And CFCs are being released by humans, but they're not a greenhouse gas. They destroy ozone, and that is a bad, that's a problem, but it's a separate problem. So speaking of the carbon cycle, I'm talking about how processes either remove CO2 from the atmosphere or add it to the atmosphere, um, and how CO2 is, is turned into hydrocarbons or vice versa, or how CO2 is turned into carbonate. The difference between the carbon cycle and the water cycle is that in the water cycle, water does change phase. It goes from being liquid water to water vapor, or from being water vapor to liquid, or from liquid water to ice. Um, in the carbon cycle, you get, uh, but the thing with water is that it's always H2O. Um, in the carbon cycle, you actually get CO2 being chemically changed into another carbon compound, like CO2 being converted to hydrocarbons like you get in trees or being converted to carbonate like you get in the ocean. Um, did you have a question? I heard your microphone come on for a sec. Okay. Um, but so what can add CO2 to the atmosphere? Um, cell respiration. When, uh, when organisms break down sugars to get energy, that releases CO2. That can't really be helped. Um, if you if organisms decompose or if they're burned, um, and that includes burning of fossil fuels, that converts hydrocarbons into CO2. And volcanic eruptions also release CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, if carbon is buried before it decomposes, like if swamp plants are buried and become coal, or if phytoplankton is buried and becomes oil, then that actually is a sink. It removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, um, forming carbonates in the ocean, like when snails and phytoplankton and corals um, secrete carbonate from the ocean, that overall removes carbon dioxide because what they're doing is they're taking carbon that started as dissolved carbon dioxide in the ocean and putting it in solid form. And when those organisms die, the it stays solid because their shells last longer than them. And it usually ends up being subducted. Um, some of it ends up back in volcanoes, but a lot of it just gets shoved into the mantle and taken away. You also have um, when CO2 is converted into trees, then that locks carbon up for longer periods because plants like trees and cacti um, convert more CO2 to hydrocarbons, then they lose hydrocarbons via cell respiration. Um, and that's one reason why de deforestation is so bad because you're taking away long-lived plants that have been locking up carbon and replacing them with short-lived plants that burn easily and that decompose quickly. 
And then silicate weathering, which is when um, which is when um, CO2 in the atmosphere actually forms carbonate ions on land when um, and you get reactions with silicate minerals. So I talked about volcanoes a little bit and how their effect on climate change is complicated, how people try to invoke them as a possible cause of modern temperature increases, but how that's hard to quantify, how that's doesn't really align with the data. So the true or false question here is volcanic activity, which releases both CO2 and aerosols, contributes only to global warming and not to global cooling. So I mentioned two things that volcanoes release, and you want to think about what they do. And it's false because aerosols are little particles in the air, and that causes global cooling. The particles released by volcanoes actually block sunlight out. So yes, CO2 from volcanoes can create global warming, but volcanoes, if they release a lot of ash, can also cause Earth's temperatures to drop. So I talked a little bit about feedbacks. And what a feedback is in a climate context is how if a system is in equilibrium, in response to a shift from that equilibrium, a process might either correct itself and bring the system back, and that would be a negative feedback, or it'll initiate further processes that take the system farther and farther away from equilibrium. And the current climate crisis is marked by a number of positive feedback processes that are making the situation worse because positive feedback, again, has nothing to do with whether it's good or not. So in the example question here, this is something I've been alluding to throughout this lecture. The, the melting of blank, the frozen layer in the Arctic soil from climate change is releasing methane, an example of a blank feedback. And those are ice sheets, negative, ice sheets, positive, permafrost, negative, permafrost, positive. So for this, you just want to know what permafrost is. And so the answer is indeed D, permafrost is melting. That's releasing more methane. That is a positive feedback cycle. Just a few more slides. In lecture 16, we moved on to talking about paleoclimatology and different ways in which we can study ancient climates. So we have proxies, like we can study how varves or the alternating patterns in the glacial outwash sediment that ends up in lakes. Um, the light layers form during the summer when you get a lot of meltwater and get a lot of glacial sediment ending up in the lakes. The dark layers form during the winter when there's not as much glacial meltwater. Um, if the thickness, if the relative thickness of these bands changes, that can indicate that, for example, if the black bands get larger and the, the light bands get smaller, that indicates that there were longer winters. There were fewer periods, there were shorter periods in which the glaciers melted significantly and carried outwash to the lakes. Um, and that if we can figure out roughly when these sediments were deposited, we can study changes in global average temperature during that time. We can look at ocean sediments um, and we'll be looking for carbonates in those ocean sediments. We'll be looking for fossils of phytoplankton and we'll be studying the oxygen isotopes in those ocean set in those carbonates. We'll study cave formations and we'll be looking at the carbonate in those cave formations to study the oxygen isotopes. Um, we'll also look at the thickness of tree rings um, and we'll look at plant fossils. And then we have one more direct method, which is using ice cores. And when we use ice cores, we can actually um, we can actually sample air that was trapped in the ice from ancient times and figure out what the temperature was roughly by looking at CO2 concentrations. So the reason that we've been able to establish that present CO2 con um, concentrations are a lot higher than they've been at any other point through human history is through ice cores. Using ice cores, we can we can study what atmospheric CO2 concentrations were like, even from periods in time when there wasn't the technology to do that. So the Romans, the ancient Romans didn't have the ability to measure CO2 concentrations, but we can look at CO2 concentrations from 500, from 200 AD when, when Rome exists, when ancient, when the Roman Empire existed and be like, oh, okay, that's what the CO2 concentrations were like during Tiberius's reign. Um, because we can actually, we can actually obtain dates from the ice pretty easily because the accumulation rate in Antarctica has been pretty consistent. So um, it's pretty easy to take the depth in an ice core and figure out how old the ice at that level is. 
you just have to make a correction because the ice compacts later than it settles. When the ice first falls, it is not compact enough to trap air. As the ice piles up on top of it, it will compact the ice underneath it enough to trap the air. And we just have to calculate when that is using whatever accumulation rate of snow is appropriate. Because you're going to get a different rate for Antarctica and different parts of Antarctica. Um, and you'll have a different one for Greenland. So the first half of the lecture was largely about how we've used climate records from Antarctica to look at CO2 concentrations. We've also used borehole temperatures, just measuring the temperature um, of the ice itself to examine how temperatures have changed over time. We've looked at oxygen isotopes. Um, oxygen isotopes will, in carbonate has oxygen in it, and oxygen isotopes in carbonate will change as more glaciers grow or as glaciers um, retreat because different processes will take up more of the heavier isotope versus the lighter isotope. So for example, when there's more glaciers, the lighter oxygen isotope, O16, which ends up in water vapor, a lot more of that's going to end up locked up in the glacier because rainfall is going to carry a lot more rainfall is going to get locked up in glaciers for long periods. So the ocean will have a lot more O18. And likewise, the carbonate that we find in ocean sediments will have more O18 in it. And the last lecture was, a, the last part of the lecture was about the specific effects of increased CO2 emissions in Antarctica. So we focused on how we've seen rising air temperatures, especially in West Antarctica, how the oceans have gotten warmer, how the winds have gotten stronger from more energy being in the oceans, how um, sea ice has melted in many areas and that's caused decreased albedo because that's replaced a reflective surface, um, the sea ice, or in some cases the ice shelves with open ocean water, which is dark and absorbs a lot more solar radiation than does ice. Um, and that's also heavily affected krill and other species dependent on the sea ice. Um, and we've seen animals and plants change their ranges. We've seen salp spread at the expense of krill. Um, as sea ice has depleted, we've seen, um, we've seen Antarctica's land plants expand their ranges. We've seen um, Adelie penguins, which rely on the sea ice to breed retreat farther south to areas where the sea ice is stronger. And the effects on Antarctica have maybe not been as uniformly breathtakingly bad as those on the Arctic because sea ice loss on Antarctica hasn't been quite as dramatic. It's still worrying that we're starting to see, we're seeing penguin populations start to change and we're seeing, we're seeing bits of ice shelves the extensions of glaciers, which were thought to be pretty stable, we're seeing large portions of those break off in response to warmer oceans, causing them to break up faster. And there's a lot of worry about what's going to happen to Antarctica in the future, what's going to happen to Antarctica's unique marine life, um, including some really specialized organisms that might be outcompeted by invasive species from warmer temperatures. Um, so the potential question here is about one of the organisms I just talked about, and it's which is which of the following creatures is seeing its range increase as a result of melting sea ice? And those are emperor penguins, salp, krill, Antarctic toothfish, and midges. So which one of these really likes just swimming in open water? And which one have I talked about in that context? And yep, the answer is salp. Salp are open water organisms that we are seeing a lot more of now that sea ice is disappearing. So any questions about the climate change unit that you wanted me to address that I didn't get to? Any final questions before I close out the review session today? You're welcome. and. Again, I've really enjoyed being your teacher this term, even though things have been a little strange and a little bit not ideal for everybody, but I've still really enjoyed making these lectures and I hope you've enjoyed the class. And even after the class, feel free to keep in touch with me um, via email and regarding the practice final. Yes, it's, um, it's, I think, 
I got to double check, but it's it, it says on Gaucho Space, but I think it's either 15 or 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes to answer 10 questions, because it's not it's not a full practice final. It's just a sampling of 10 questions that are similar to ones you'll see. So I think it's 15 minutes, but um, but you can double check that. And then again, during finals week, I'll be available for office hours from 8 to 10 on Monday, June 7th. I'm sorry I have to push that one to the evening again. I don't really have a way around that. Wednesday, June 9th, I'll be available from 2 to 4 p.m. Um, and if there's times outside of that that would work better, then if you just if you let me know with a bit of time, I can meet. So thanks again for coming. And um, this is the final lecture for this course. So good luck studying for the final. And feel free to email me with questions or keeping in touch with Antarctica stuff if there's anything I didn't get to during this course. So take care.